Today's lesson is on heat and temperature. Heat and temperature are two different things. Temperature is a measurement of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in the object, and heat is the transfer of energy between objects. Heat and temperature are two different things. Uh, one way to think about it is you can only give and receive heat. You can have a temperature, but you can't give a temperature. So you can have a temperature, but you can give and receive heat. It's like love. You can't have love. You aren't love. You only give and receive love. That's how heat works. So let's take a look. Temperature is defined as a measure of the internal energy of an object. You can see here we have two thermometers measuring the atoms in, these, in this box. The box on the left, the atoms are moving much faster. The box on the right, the atoms are moving much slower. When atoms are moving faster, the temperature rises. When atoms slow down, the temperature drops. There are three temperature scales. We have the Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin scale. Fahrenheit's what we use here in America. Celsius is where they use with the SI system. And Kelvin is the absolute temperature scale. The Kelvin scale has a value associated with it called absolute zero. We'll talk more about absolute zero later in the lesson. But zero Kelvin is the lower limit of temperature. So that's why we use this Kelvin scale as our baseline scale. Fahrenheit and Celsius, couple significant points here. The boiling point of water in Fahrenheit is 212. The boiling point of water in Celsius is 100. The freezing point of water in Fahrenheit is 32. The freezing point in Celsius is 0 Celsius. You need to know those temperatures. So make sure that you are aware of them and uh, commit them to memory. The absolute zero, the lower limit of temperature, is negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, or zero Kelvin. Absolute zero is the point at which the object has no volume. If you look over there on the bottom right at that graph, absolute zero, zero Kelvin, you can also see that the volume of the object is zero. The pressure of the object at absolute zero is equal to zero. So inside the object, there's actually no motion taking place at absolute zero. Absolute zero is a theoretical temperature. We can't actually reach absolute zero. In theory, we think we can get to absolute zero, but we can't actually get there because for an object to have no energy, for no motion to be occurring, for it to have no volume, the object's everything inside of it would have to be at rest. Remember, we said that temperature is the average internal energy. And we also learned this year that kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So if something's moving, it has kinetic energy. So if anything inside the object is moving, it has kinetic energy and the object has an internal energy. So even the electrons orbiting the nucleus and the atoms of the object, they have a kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy would give the object a temperature. So to reach absolute zero, the electrons would actually have to stop moving inside the object. This would mean the object has no volume and we're at absolute zero. That would violate the law of conservation of energy. So that's how or why we call absolute zero theoretical temperature, because in theory we could get there. In theory we could take all the energy out of an object, but in reality we can't do it because then the object would lose its volume so it would cease to exist and that would violate the law of conservation of energy. On the other end, however, objects can have no upper limit to their temperature. There are stars that are unfathomably large. Their temperature is so hot, we're talking millions, billions of degrees Celsius. There's no upper limit. We're just a grain of sand, the Earth is, even our sun in the vastness of the solar system. So even though we get all of our energy from the sun, our sun is very, very, very small compared to the largest star. That largest star has a tremendous amount of temperature. When things get hot, when their internal energy goes up, they expand. Thermal expansion is the change in size or volume due to an increased energy level of the atoms within. If you look on the right, you can see a pictorial representation of this. The atoms that are moving slower don't expand the box as much as the atoms moving faster. Just like we talked about hot air balloons, when you excite the atoms, we blow hot air into the hot air balloon, it excites the atoms, those atoms now have the energy to do work on the walls of the container. They push the hot air balloon and make it bigger, and then it can create a large buoyant force and float. 
Likewise, if you put a balloon inside the refrigerator, a regular old balloon, the atoms move slower, the volume of the balloon shrinks. So thermal expansion is this relationship to temperature and volume. You can see the railroad tracks on your left. Um, thermal expansion is occurring here. The atoms in the steel are getting moving quicker. They have a higher kinetic energy. They can move, do more work, so they push apart. That's why nowadays we put expansion joints in railroad ties and expansion joints in metal bridges. Actually, some bridges, one end of the bridge isn't even fixed, so that as the bridge gets hot and expands, it has the freedom to move, so it doesn't buckle. You can see the tremendous force in the thermal expansion. Think about the amount of energy and force it takes to bend a steel, tie, a steel uh, beam like that and move those giant railroad ties. A tremendous amount of energy is incurred or involved in thermal expansion. One thing that doesn't expand when it's heated up or cooled down, one thing that's an anomaly is water. Water is most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. So you can see our density and temperature chart here. So at 4 degrees Celsius, water is not yet in a solid state. It's still, um, excuse me, it's a liquid state. So at 4 degrees Celsius, as the pond cools down or whatever you have cooling down, the cold water moves to the bottom. And then over here on the left, you can see as this cools down, right, in both directions, or over here, this side, sorry, at 0 degrees Celsius, it's less dense than it is at 4 degrees Celsius. Things that are, excuse me, at 0 degrees Celsius, it's more, it's less dense than at 1 degree Celsius. So the more dense 1 degree Celsius is going to sink, and the ice at 0 degrees Celsius is going to float. So what happens is ice floats on top of water. To our right over here, you can see that that ice, as it cools down and freezes, notice how the top freezes to the bottom. Down here at the bottom of the cup, you can see this freezes after all the ice, or the majority of the ice on the top is formed. Just because of the shape of the cup, you can't see it as well. But the idea is, since ice is less dense in a frozen state than it is in a liquid state, the ice floats on the top. And this is super important to our ecosystem. Because in the wintertime, all of the fish are going to be able to live underneath the ice. And all the food that the fish eat live underneath the ice. If ice was more dense than water, ice would sink to the bottom and kill all the food on the bottom of the pond. Likewise, kill all the fish. Also, our glaciers that we get our natural water from, they all are from seawater. Seawater actually spits out the ice when it freezes. So the glaciers were formed when seawater froze. Glaciers float to the top of the ocean, and then when the continents or the glaciers moved, um, the freshwater stayed on top. If the opposite were true, all of our freshwater would be at the bottom of the ocean, and we would cease to exist. So this natural phenomenon of ice being most dense at 4 degrees Celsius is very important. Heat, as I said, is the transfer of energy, the spontaneous transfer. It transfers automatically without being forced to. On the left, when you bring two cold things together, the heat is going to transfer. Heat always transfers from hot to cold. So when you put an ice cube in your drink, the ice cube cools down your drink. But the heat is flowing from your drink to your ice cube. As the heat flows from your drink to your ice cube, it loses energy. And that's what causes the temperature of your drink to go down. You can see in our little picture here of conduction, we'll learn about the different types of transferring heat next lesson. But here in this lesson, the conduction, you can see the molecules are moving around. As you heat the molecules on the left, they collide with the ones next to them, and the heat is slowly pushed down the line. This happens quicker in some materials, slower in other materials, but this is how conduction works, from the collision of the molecules colliding with each other. The energy for heat or the unit for heat is joules, just like work. Heat is a type of energy. Heat flow. Heat always flows from higher to lower temperatures. Always. Heat always goes from hot to cold. On the left, you have a cocoa. The hot chocolate there, the heat is flowing outward. Ice cream, the opposite happens. The heat from the outside air flows towards the ice cream, heats it up, and melts the ice cream. That's why if you leave your ice cream out, 
or your drink with ice in it out, it's going to take the same temperature as the air temperature because those molecules are constantly colliding with it, transferring their heat. The other way to transfer heat is to do work on it. Here's a good picture of uh, someone starting a fire by using mechanical energy and heating up that rope or whatever they have there in their hands. And then when that rope gets hot, they can take it down and touch it to the kindling and start a fire. This is one of the first ways we learned how to start fire. And there's a few ways, this method of heating by doing work, creating friction. And you know if you rub your hands together, you can feel the heat generating between your palms. Finally, we're just going to look at some metric units here. The metric units for heat, uh, we have the calorie and the kilocalorie. Calorie with a small c is a very small amount. You can see one gram of water is like a drop of water. To raise that one degree Celsius doesn't take very much energy. A kilocalorie, a kilogram of water, that's 2.2 two pounds. That's a little more energy. That's like boiling a pot on the stove. To raise that one degree Celsius is a lot of energy. When you look at... Uh, packaging in the store and they have the calories listed those are kilocalories that's a capital C so they tell us we should burn or eat 2,000 calories a day although that's not necessarily true for everyone um, that idea of calorie is a measure of heat uh, BTUs BTUs are the English system British thermal units uh, that's raising the temperature of one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit and then the relationship, 4.184 joules is one calorie, or 4,184 joules is one kilocalorie.